Now, a key point about the complexity of the brain, and this is really a very key point, because one of the objections is, oh, the brain is too complex. I mean, there's 100 trillion neurons and uh, 100 billion neurons, 1,000 connections per neuron, 1,000 ion channels per connection. It's all these many nonlinearities. Uh, this is a level of complexity that's just way beyond today's technology. Uh, that is the apparent complexity if you look at a mature brain. But the design of the brain is a billion times simpler than that. How do we know that? Well, the design of the brain is in the genome. The genome has the design of the human body and brain. And it's 800 million bytes, but it's replete with redundancies. One sequence ALU is repeated 300,000 times. I show in the book how you, you can compress using lossless compression the genome down to 30 to 100 million bytes. So the, the genome, which describes the, human, the design of the body and brain, has 30 to 100 million bytes, which is less than Microsoft Word. And it's not, my point is not that it's a simple system, uh, but it's a level of complexity that we can handle. And how do you get a brain that's much more complex than the design it starts with? Uh, basically, it's a probabilistic fractal. It expands itself uh, through a lot of stochastic or random processes. Uh, and the cerebellum is a good example. The cerebellum basically says, the genome says the following about the cerebellum. Well, let me back up. If you look at the cerebellum, you say, my God, this is a vast amount of complexity. How could we ever hope to understand this? You just see uh, trillions of these incredibly tangled bundles of, of connections. It looks like this vast system that's just beyond our intelligence to understand. We understand it because there's actually only tens of thousands of bytes of design information. The genome says the following about the cerebellum. It says there's four different types of neurons that are organized kind of like this in one cell. Now repeat that 10 billion times and add a little bit of random variation within the following constraints with each repetition. That is what the uh, genome says about the cerebellum. And we actually understand that. We've modeled it mathematically, and that's behind this simulation of the cerebellum. Uh, I mean, an example of a fractal, and Doug has written extensively about these. I mean, this looks, this is the Mandelbrot set. You've probably seen pictures of it. It looks very complex. How much information is in the Mandelbrot set? Well, if you take the image, it's a vast amount of information. And depending on the resolution, it can just be an indefinitely vast amount of information. The design of this is six bytes long. And similarly, the, because as it's iteratively applied, a fractal expands its information. The brain is actually a probabilistic fractal. There's a lot of random processes as it expands its information. And it's self-organizing. This, this largely randomly wired cerebellum then interacts with a complex environment, and the child learns to walk and to talk and to catch a fly ball, and it gets filled up with meaningful information. Uh, models often get simpler at higher levels. Uh, modeling one pancreatic islet cell, it's very complex. Mod modeling the whole pancreas is much simpler, and there, there is an artificial pancreas uh, in FDA tests. And the same thing is applied to these brain models. Uh, and you have to apply the abstractions at the right level. Uh, biology is theoretically based on chemistry, which is, theoretic, which is based on physics, but you don't explain what a biological system does at the level of quarks or protons, uh, maybe proteins. Uh, you have to model things at the right level. And neurobiology has its own levels of abstraction. In fact, there's several lev levels of abstraction in the brain with ideas at the highest level. And we are beginning to reverse engineer this. We are at the early stages, but this will be an exponential process. Uh, I, I won't dwell on this, but this is all driving economic gains. Uh, productivity is increasing. Uh, in fact, it's that increase in the consumption of information technology, which is increasingly pervasive in all of our economic institutions, that's driving really all of the economic growth we're seeing. The adoption of these technologies is exponential. This is e-commerce, now a trillion dollars. You might say, now wait a second, wasn't there a boom and a bust? which was experienced in this geographic area quite acutely. That was a Wall Street phenomenon. Wall Street looked at the Internet and said, wow, this is revolutionary. It's going to change every business model. And the levels went like, the values went like this. Three years later, they came back and said, it hasn't changed all the business models. I guess we were wrong, and all the values went like that. Uh, the actual adoption was exponential. But remember, an exponential looks like nothing's happening until you get some real traction. Well, we're getting real traction now with e-commerce. So let me show you an example of another technology which we put together. We created the first large vocabulary speech recognition that was commercially marketed and the first text synthesis. We put those together with language translation, created a translating telephone. The language translation actually has made a lot of progress. It's another example of how we've made exponential progress uh, in the 
in the uh, quality of software using more sophisticated pattern recognition techniques. Uh, I was at Google recently, and they applied it to this opportunity we have now for vast data mining. They took these very large Rosetta Stone texts and created a English to Arabic and Arabic to English translator that not only won the DARPA competition, but actually compared equally to human professional translators. Uh, and not, nobody on the, on the team spoke a word of Arabic, uh, basically using pattern recognition applied to very large databases. And this is actually my proposal for how we can do language, not with symbolic rules, which are very hard to do. When we did speech recognition, we didn't. We knew there were 44 phonemes. We knew various phonetic rules and so on. We didn't tell the system what they were. We let it discover it by itself from vast databases using pattern recognition. So this is, will be a routine uh, feature of your cell phone in uh, early in the next decade. This is a demonstration, comma. This is a demonstration of a prototype of a quote translating end quote telephone, period. Von einem Prototyp eines übersetzenden Telefons. Within a few years, comma, innerhalb einiger Jahre, we will be able to talk to anyone. Comma. Wir werden fähig sein zu regardless of their language. Period. Ohne Rücksicht auf ihre Sprache. The rain in Spain. Comma. La pluie en Espagne. Stays mainly in the plain. Period. Reste dans la plaine principalement. Merci pour votre attention. Period. Thank you for your attention. So, uh, excuse my French, but. Uh, <laughs> well, this is a, an image I had actually in, in the Age of Spiritual Machines. Without the dotted lines in the, in the singularity near, I put dotted lines around uh, those capabilities of computers that were soon to fall off. Uh, at the Gilded Conference, I was criticized for that only humans can drive cars, that that was going to stay on the wall. But uh, I did actually feel that that would come down. Um, let me, uh, well, another uh, progression that uh, is of interest is we're already extending beyond our horizons. This is not a new phenomena. Uh, if it wasn't for technology, half the audience wouldn't be here. The other half would be senior citizens. Uh, but what, what I've principally tried to do in the singularities in the years is deal with the objections that have come up to the age of spiritual machines. And I really have only a few minutes to touch on these. Uh, one criticism is that, that it's just from incredulity that th the results of exponential growth just seemed too incredible. But that was true 20 years ago. That's equally true today. I do think people think linearly, and that's our, our intuitive view, but the intuition, the intuitive view is, is not historically correct. Uh, people say exponential trends can't go on forever. Uh, information technology uh, transcends one paradigm to another, but even information technology has a limit. There are ultimate limits. I'd talk about what they are. Information technology will hit a wall but not before it reaches pretty extraordinary levels. Just based on the types of technologies we can touch and feel today that are already working, this is without going into any speculative realms of quantum computing or other types of computing. In fact, you can even ignore molecular three-dimensional computing, which, as I say, is working. Uh, just conventional chips will achieve a strong, cheap AI uh, in the 2020s. People say software AI is stuck in the mud. Computers still can't do, tell the difference between a dog and a cat, for example. Uh, but we are making uh, steady progress uh, in, in AI. There are hundreds of applications, as I mentioned earlier, uh, deeply embedded in our economic infrastructure. This wasn't true seven years ago when we had this last conference. These were all research projects at that time. Uh, and people really uh, tend to discount each new accomplishment of, of AI. Uh, in the book, I deal with this perspective from many different vantage points. 
uh, so for complexity uh, on log scales is progressing exponentially. Uh, chess was mentioned earlier, but the, the latest systems actually, uh, their performance is not accounted for by the brute force increase in power. They actually have better software, better pattern recognition to make the terminal leaf decision, and maybe we'll come back and explain more what that means. Algorithms are progressing. Uh, we use them a lot. The early genetic algorithms had fixed genomes, unlike real biological evolution where it could add genetic information, reassign the meaning of genes, have other non-coding genes that control the expression of coding genes. We've added these types of innovations and getting actually much uh, more dramatic results. It's a good laboratory to study uh, evolution itself. It does show that you can get more intelligence out of less but it's not a magic bullet. The proposal is not to just have some big GA create strong AI. It's one self-organizing paradigm among many uh, that we can apply to this problem. And there's many different uh, ways of looking at this. Uh, I'm on the Army Science Advisory Board, and uh, the sophistication of the autonomous systems now being developed are far more complex uh, and capable in software, not just hardware, than they were five years ago. The criticism from reliability, software is just too brittle, too crash prone. Uh, we can and do create reliable systems. 9-11 uh, intensive care systems, landing airplanes. The majority of uh, airplane landings are controlled by software. The number of times a software crash or, air, or bug has caused an airplane crash is zero. The same is not true for human landings. Uh, we, if we create software that, uh, technology that's decentralized and self-organizing, it's inherently very stable. And the quintessential example is the Internet and the, nu the number of, the amount of time that the Internet has been down over the last se uh, decade is uh, zero seconds. People say the brain's too complex. I'd address this. Thomas Ray said it would take billions of lines of code to, to describe the brain. That's looking at this apparent complexity, not the complexity of the design, which is contained in the genome. And it's not, it's not a simple system, and we're not there. And for, because of the exponential progression, we have a long way to go but we'll do it exponentially. But the amount of complexity is a level we can manage. Uh, I won't deal with these because uh, we don't have time. Let me say a few words about promise versus peril. Uh, the ethical guidelines uh, do work for uh, inadvertent problems. The Asilomar guidelines in biotech have kept us safe for 30 years. Uh, the Foresight Institute, which Christine heads up, has similar uh, uh, guidelines for nanotech. I believe they will work effectively. The big problem is advertent problems. That is actually a word. Uh, designer pathogens, self-replicating nanotech, unfriendly AI, which Eliezer has uh, written extensively and insightfully about, uh, are really the key concerns. And there's a movement that, well, let's relinquish these technologies. They're just too dangerous. Uh, there are three problems with that, and I can only summarize it, but it would require a totalitarian system to implement it would deprive us of profound benefits, and it wouldn't work. It would just drive these technologies underground where they'd be less stable, and the responsible scientists would not have access to the tools needed to defend us. The way we can defend ourselves is through narrow relinquishment of dangerous information and to invest explicitly in the defenses, something we've done with software viruses and which has actually worked quite well. And even though Bill Joy and I are cons some often considered on opposite sides of this, we've actually worked together Bill Joy got his ideas about the downsides from the age of spiritual machines. We recently wrote this op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, criticizing the dissemination of dangerous information, specifically the 1918 flu genome on the web, which we thought should be given to the scientists who needed incompetence, and also calling for a uh, Manhattan Project to uh, combat biological viruses. And uh, Majority Leader Bill Frist recently cited this op-ed uh, and endorsed both of those proposals. Uh, Bill McKibben will speak later. Uh, he's, he writes, is it possible that our technological reach is very nearly sufficient now, that our lives, at least in the West, are sufficiently comfortable? Uh, my view is no, not until we can uh, meet our energy needs, which we'll be able to do with uh, nanotechnology, nano-engineered solar panels and fuel cells, which can capture the only 1% of 1% of the sunlight that falls on the Earth to meet 100% of our energy needs in a clean, renewable fashion overcome disease and death, overcome poverty, and a few other problems. Only technology, advanced, nanoscale, distributed, decentralized, self-organizing, increasingly intelligent technology has the scale to solve these 
uh, problems that uh, human species has struggled with for eons. So let's say, okay, overcoming disease and disabilities, those are good things, but we shouldn't go beyond normal human capabilities. Uh, as I say, most of the audience wouldn't be here if, that, if we hadn't already gone beyond normal human abilities. Uh, I really have two responses to that. One is, what is normal? I mean, the guy who was whistling some music in the lobby of my hotel this morning, is that normal musical ability? I, I hope not. Uh, or Beethoven and, Beatles, and the Beatles, uh, is that normal uh, musical ability? There's a wide range of abilities, a wide diversity of abilities. Uh, going beyond normal is not a new story. We are the species that seeks to go beyond our limitations. And people say death gives meaning to life, it gives meaning to time, but we really get meaning from what's unique about the human species is we create knowledge, that knowledge base is expanding exponentially. Uh, I've been at lots of conferences where scientists are very fond of saying, we're not unique, uh, we used to think we were, the universe doesn't revolve around us, we're not descended from the gods, we're descended from primates, from worms, but we are unique after all. Those few tens of thousands of bytes of genetic information, which were the enabling factors for us to create technology, has enabled us to create an expanding knowledge base and, and expand our horizons. So in summary, uh, I believe this takeoff is soft. I am a conservative in some quarters. Uh, exponential growth, uh, which will continue uh, based on known physics uh, of information technology and known paradigms and known technologies that are working without any speculative technologies is gradual, incremental, smooth, there's no silver bullet, but ultimately will be profoundly transformative. Thank you very much.